ladies and gentlemen, we are just lucky to have some of Valerie's time. Let me tell you, Valerie is a very diplomatic, dedicated and respected business leader that is recognized for leading and inspiring people around the world and delivering excellence. Uh, she has had an exceptional career, but she, more importantly, she's an exceptional presenter, speaker, facilitator, coach, and influencer with over 25 years of working hands in gloves with the CXO, so the C-level at corporations. Uh, Valerie has held a number of positions at Xerox. Let me give you two or three. She was vice president of channels, uh, uh, marketing for North America operations in her last role, uh, but she has been vice president of sales and customer service, U.S. clients de and delivery operations. She also was for a period of time vice president and general manager of document production systems group in Canada, so an international experience. Uh, today, she serves as the chair of the board of directors and executive committee for Volunteer New York, a very important charity in this particular time, a very important foundation in this particular time. So without further ado, Valerie, welcome. Welcome. And let Thank me... You. Welcome. Thank you. Let me get right into... Uh, the questions so that we can get into the crisp of things. How did communication and more specifically public speaking all start for you? What helped you develop your confidence levels and how important is confidence in the act of speaking? Wow, Gilles, that's, a, that's an amazing question. Um, and it gives me pause for the many uh, years that I've had um, coming through. And you know what? It really all started in my childhood. Um, being a, a friend to all of my friends and always wanting to take the role as teacher <laughs> when we would play school. Um, but I think more importantly, what the first opportunity was, was at my church. When I had come back from my first four years of higher education in college, and was back to start my career. And my minister had come to me and said, listen, I really need someone to do the morning announcements. And uh, you're just fresh back from college. I'm gonna give you a shot. What about it? And I was like, <laughs> in front of the whole congregation. <laughs> I mean, I really had never spoken in front of uh, people before besides, you know, five or six people. And uh, this was in, in front of the entire congregation. And it was an amazing experience because it gave me an opportunity first to practice in front of uh, a lot of people. And more importantly, it was interesting because while we had a certain structure to communicate the different activities that were happening at the church, inevitably, the pastor would like, right before I would walk out, hand me like, five or six sheets of paper <laughs> with new information on it that I could not prepare for. Um, and I would just have to go out there and be able to interject it into the right areas. Um, but that, you know, standing in front of even my congregation, I would always have these butterflies in my stomach and I would always in my head say, I'm probably gonna stutter the words, but I would center myself before I would go through the doors and then enter and go up to the microphone, take a deep breath and start to breathe and be able to just move right into the words of the announcements. And doing that every Sunday, it built up my confidence. And then as I went into my career at uh, Xerox, any opportunity I had to stand in front of people to communicate, share ideas, um, or position a product demonstration was always important. And that was another thing, you know, in my early career at Xerox, one of the things we had to do was memorize a script mm. of a particular product. And we would have to reiterate re, uh, it word by word, otherwise you would be marked incorrect. And I used to say to myself, this is ridiculous. Why do we need to do that? I know the product, I can go sell it. But what it did do is it enabled you with the talk track that you needed 
And again, it builds confidence that you knew your product inside and out better than anybody. And it was an opportunity when you were on a sales call, you would magically remember some of those words in that demonstration as a part of your sales call that would show the customer the benefits. So each of those opportunities give me confidence. Just like today, Gio, this opportunity speaking with you is again an opportunity for me to be able to communicate and to build my confidence in front of a new audience, which is an Instagram audience. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm, I'm so glad to have this opportunity with you and honored. And what you said about the sales side, and Xerox was an incredible school for sales, is so important. And it leads me to my other question, which is, you know, what makes you an international public speaker? What makes people listen to you? You know, that's a, <laughs> it's a very interesting question. Never in my wildest dreams that I ever anticipate being able to travel around the globe, meet so many different people and have opportunities to uh, exchange and communicate. And through my career at Xerox, especially up in Canada, having the opportunity to travel across the entire country, delivering our strategies, our sales processes, as well as inviting customers to exchanges where we would talk about business issues were all opportunities for me to engage. The good thing was I also had a tutor up in Canada because whenever I traveled to Montreal or Quebec, I wanted to make sure that I acknowledged the language of the people there. And I would speak a little bit of French, bonjour, como se va, se va bien. And then I would have to immediately go back to English. <laughs> but I think what it did is it gave an appreciation to my audience that I cared about them. And then we were going to get to the subjects at hand. I also was given many opportunities to speak on behalf of women in leadership positions because when I was up in Canada running, this was the largest business unit for the Canadian operations, the document production business. There were not many women in executive leadership positions. And we were really at the forefront of it because our CEO of Canada happened to be an American female as well. But we were given opportunities to speak to women about what it meant to be an executive leader and therefore, I would be speaking to people from many different nationalities, because even though it was Canada, there are a lot of Africans that live in Canada. There are a lot of Europeans that live in Canada. And so it would be almost an international audience inside of the Canadian uh, uh, environment. But, but that gave me the opportunity to recognize sometimes certain words don't translate the way in which I understand them but my audience might not. And it was interesting because there were opportunities where I had to get feedback on certain words that I may use that were very well known in the Americas, but not so much in other audiences. So it gave me pause to say, whenever you speak on an international basis, A, make sure you understand your audience, then B, what are the objectives that the audience is coming there for so you can develop your message and then see, be able to come very well prepared and be present with the type of topic that is interesting for them, as well as you, the deliverer, having excitement and fun in delivering that as well. So in order to get people to listen to you, you have to have something to say, but it has to be something that resonates with the audience, not necessarily what you wanna say, and it's so important to make sure that you are prepared and understand the message and be able to deliver accordingly. Does that make sense to you? It completely makes sense. And, and I just want to take a pause because it's so rich what you're saying. And I want to acknowledge all the people who are here. Please interact with us, ask questions if you, if you want, and we may be able to take one or two questions. But you were speaking of causes. You are, you are advocates for causes, for many causes, as I've known you over the years. Uh, and you have causes that are dear to your heart. Should we always and only speak with purpose? You know, it is very true that I have passions for many different causes. Obviously, being the chair of Volunteer New York, volunteerism is very near and dear to my heart. Being a Black female, um, obviously, I need to give back 
to women of color, uh, giving them some of the leads and clues of what it is that it means to be a black female. But you have to have also purpose. And so what is your purpose? Why are you here talking to these individuals? And not having that drive inside of yourself, that purpose, you will not come across to your audience as being authentic, truthful, and genuine. And therefore, the audience won't connect with what you have to say. So even though you may be very much in um, a heartfelt cause, if you don't have the purpose behind it and be able to articulate that, it doesn't come across very, very well. But I will say this, I do have a bias. I'm not going to hide it. I do want to see women succeed and specifically women of color. And I really am very much driven on the girls that are coming up because they're our future. And if anybody needs to help them, we do. And if I can help one out there, then I have done my job. But hopefully, God will bless me where I can help many. Wow, this is very powerful. Thank you so much, Valerie. So stand for what you stand for and, and make, a, make a message, put a message out there and, and do things. And actually, you do so many things, but you don't speak about them. It's pretty amazing. So let me get on to my next question. You have a very rich career, Valerie, global leadership experience, board level experience in business education. And, and you're going to be the, you know, you're going to be doing the commencement speech at the Mercy College. Uh, uh, and we had a sneak preview, uh, which I put on my, on my uh, Facebook page. Thank you for that. Thank and you for that. Yeah, and you're, you're currently the chair of the Board of Directors and Executive Committee of Volunteer New York. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about them and what this means. But most importantly, you have also had quite a career at Xerox. What are some of the fundamental things you would recommend to our listeners, uh, th uh, things that they should do if they want to rock their world when they speak? <laughs> wow, well, that's that's a big loaded question there, Gilles. Um, you have too much uh, confidence in me, uh, <laughs> but let me peel let me peel it back and see if I can address uh, your your question. Uh, first and foremost, Volunteer New York. Volunteer New York is an organization that is located in Westchester County, New York, and it supports Westchester County, Rockland County, Putnam County, and what it is is a connecting organization. We are basically like the Intel and side chip of any computer. We work with over 500 nonprofits in our area, and we try to connect their needs with volunteers that are looking to serve in our communities. And, you know, the organization quickly pivoted in this pandemic that we're in right now, and we quickly set up a virtual volunteer center, and we're supporting all of the nonprofits that are doing things like collecting food or having uh, the opportunity for drivers to be able to go food shopping for seniors that can't get out of their homes and then dropping the the bags right in front of their doors to students um, signing up with uh, nursing centers that want to write cards and letters to seniors that obviously can't have family members come through and things of that nature so Volunteer New York is about transforming relationships, bringing together organizations and people both in the nonprofit world and for-profit world, and really find ways to help people be what Martin Luther King said, everybody can be great because everybody can be great. So that's a little bit about Volunteer New York, and you can look us up at Volunteer New York, spell New York out, uh, dot org, volunteernewyork.org, and um, you can find out more information. But the, the other question you asked me was about my experiences and the things that I would offer relative to uh, your listening audience to help them find their way to rock it out. Yes, <laughs> so I, yes exactly. Little, um, but I would say this, you know, any opportunity that came my way at Xerox even though I may have had in my own head, you know, what I wanted to do at Xerox, 
Sometimes it was a sideways opportunity. Sometimes it was a, an upward experience. But the thing about it was, was that word experience. Getting an opportunity and not turning it down, engaged in what it was, making sure that I performed, and learning throughout that opportunity gave me experiences that I could then talk about in my future jobs. And so you really need to just take a step back not always think you have total control over everything because things happen for a reason. And the reasons are for you to step in, be willing and able to learn as much as you can, make sure you understand who the influencers are, who the decision makers are, and leverage the people that you have on your own personal board as your CEO of me and go to those mentors and sponsors and make sure that you are delivering against the objectives that they have put forth. Always remember to perform, make sure that you are your true self and bring value and always be a constant learner. And then when given the opportunity, you will rise to the occasion and you will rock. Yeah, wow. Such a rich, uh you know, interaction and, and experience. Uh, and, and I'm sure the listeners are taking notes. Please feel free to ask a few questions. We have one that we will take a bit later, Yuli. Let me go through a few more questions first. For entrepreneurs and people who must sell, because selling is really important, what advice would you give them? Well, you know, first and foremost, whether you're an entrepreneur or you're in small business or nonprofit or in large organizations, we all sell. Um, and the thing about it is, is you have to understand your product, your service, or your solution that you're delivering. I mean, like the back of your hand. You really have to understand it. But by the same token, you need to understand your competition. So what are your strengths and what are your weaknesses against the competition. So making sure you have all of that well understood. Then research your customer. Understand everything there is to know about that customer. Who that customer is, what industry are they in, what types of industry trends are happening that could be impacting their business, both positive and or negative. What innovations are they bringing to the table? And then you need to really put together your own talk track of how you're going to go in and talk to that customer. And we all have to understand, you don't go in selling your product right away. You need to go in learning about that customer. Because it's interesting, you know, Gilles, with everything being at our fingertips, all types of information, until you have a discussion with the individual, Sometimes what you read may not necessarily be all that it is. And you gain that information so clearly when you're in there talking to the customer. One last thing of advice I would give is make sure you have some prepared questions. And those questions should not be questions where the client would answer yes or no. Because that's not a dialogue and you're not gaining anything from that but make them more empowering questions, which gives the client opportunities, in fact, to pause and go, you know what, that's a really good question. And then they can start to talk. And what that does is it starts to build your credibility with that client, that customer, that there is value for them to be spending their time with you to be able to articulate what it is they're experiencing, and to hear from you what it is you're able to give. So one of the rules that we should all make sure we do is before you speak, listen. And you should be a really good listener. And then when you have a follow-up discussion with the client, you have more rich information that you can really start to tie what you bring to the table, unlike anybody else and go in there with conviction and confidence, with purpose, that the client can absolutely realize this is the person I want to do business with because they're going to take care of me and my business. And therein lies the strike of a great working relationship. 
Wow, Valerie, this is so powerful, so deep. Thank you so much. I, I have a, a, you know, a follow-on question, which is, you must have lots of anecdotes to share with the public that is listening to us. And everybody, please stay put. Uh, I know there's a couple questions that you ask, and we will be asking them before the end, but please stay put. This is so rich, and I hope you're taking copious notes. Nadia, thank you for summarizing some of the points. So you must have a lot of uh, anecdotes to share with the public. What have you learned over the years from a communication standpoint that could be useful to them? <laughs> I really wish we had more time. Uh, there are so many that I could share with you, Gilles. But, you know, one comes to mind uh, when I first became a, a manager at Xerox. And my first position was a sales planning manager. And what that position was, was managing um, our new trainees. I had to do training, supply reps. But I was also responsible for all events that our district manager, who uh, happened to be a black male, um, needed to do. And it was my first tour of duty to get together and put together our sales kickoff meeting. And as you know, at the beginning of any sales year, the kickoff meeting is so important because you deliver so many messages and strategies that will enable the salespeople to get excited and motivated to go sell. This particular kickoff meeting, our CEO and chairman of the company was coming to our sales kickoff. He had never been to our district before, which was out on Long Island in New York. And so we decided to have it at one of the best hotels in the area, which was called the Garden City Hotel. And we had to do it in the afternoon because the CEO couldn't get there until the afternoon. So that gave me an opportunity in the morning to stop by the office, sit with the district manager, go through everything and make sure we were very well prepared for an outstanding kickoff meeting. So I put on this brand new suit. I had just got out and gotten out of college. I had been working at this uh, fashion boutique. So I went back there and I bought a beautiful suit. The color of the suit was like a turquoise blue, um, like a teal color, like a greenish blue. And I had a white blouse on and it had silver stripes as well as teal stripes. And I had the matching you know, colored accessories. <laughs> and I walked into the district manager's office very proud of my outfit and was getting ready to, you know, get into the meeting about our kickoff. And he took one look at me, Gilles, and he said, what are you wearing? I said, oh, you like it? It's my brand new suit. I was so proud. And he says, what color is that? <laughs> And I said, you know, it's the latest fashion suit. And he said, exactly. This is not a fashion show. We are not coming to the kickoff meeting to promote fashion. We are coming to this meeting to promote business excellence, corporate business structure. He said, so I know you have a blue pinstripe suit. I also know you have a navy blue suit. I know you have white blouses and blue blouses, and I need for you to go home and change your clothes. He said, because I have talked to the CEO about you being a high potential in this company, and to be able to see you sitting around his boardroom table one day as an executive leader of Xerox. He said, and what I don't need for you to communicate before you open one word coming out of your mouth is I'm into fashion and look at this teal blue suit. He said, because he's not going to hear anything you say after that. He's going to be trying to scratch his head about why is she wearing this color? Would I really have her sitting around my table, et cetera, et cetera. And so I went home, I changed my clothes, and I was the host of the CEO. So he was going to be with me the entire afternoon. And I absolutely made sure that we were on the same playing field relative to when he looked at me, he saw a business corporate figure. Now, after that, it was up to me 
and the communications and the conversation that I would have with him, which was all around the business strategy, making sure he understood, I understood the corporate direction and how we were going to implement it in our uh, region and be successful with it, et cetera, et cetera. Next time I met him, which was months later, A, he remembered my name, B, he remembered our conversation, and C, he asked, how can I help you? If you need anything, please let me know. So clearly, Shields, taking that advice, that before I even said a word, I might have been communicating something to the CEO that would have had his mind thinking something other than the, the messages I was delivering around our strategies and development. And I tell you, I would have never known had he not explained to me that piece of advice. And whether or not that was a great outfit, it wasn't appropriate for that meeting. And did I wear that outfit in future meetings? Absolutely, but never in front of my CEO and, and chairman. Indeed. And, and so that's an anecdote that I can share with the audience today. Thank you. It was funny, but it was memorable. Funny, memorable, and, and so important because these are, you know, the little things that we don't think about. And I think you, you're speaking about the, the CEO, chairman and CEO called David Kearns. Was that the run? Yeah. yeah. And David, that is Kearns, correct. David Kearns was one of the most beloved CEO that Xerox has ever had. And he's transformed the organization extraordinarily. So this little detail, if Hollis Chinky Fat, who must have been your district manager at the time, had not given you that tough love, asked you to go home, you might have, you know, lost an opportunity of a lifetime because David Kearns might never have thought about you ever again. And he remembered your name, remembered you know what you had said this is this is really really golden thank you for that that uh, piece of of advice and you know Jill, just one thing uh, for the audience uh you know perceptions matter and you may not even realize the perceptions that you're setting up for someone else and you're never going to change an individual but you have to realize they come with their unconscious bias they have limiting beliefs and they have assumptions that you can't necessarily tear down, but you want to neutralize them. And so basically what Hollis gave me was that neutralizing factor. Yeah, yeah. And with the audience, if it's okay, we're going to go five minutes over the time. We're supposed to finish at uh, 12, but it's so rich. Uh, there are two questions that you have asked, which I will take. I have two more questions uh, for you, Valerie. I'm going to give you the two questions together, if you don't mind. And then we'll take the two questions from the audience. So before we take those questions, um, would you kindly give three or four tips uh, you would want uh, to give to the audience as takeaways? And also, very importantly, I want to finish with that. As an African-American lady, what kind of challenges were in your way to break the glass ceiling and how did you manage? <sighs> <laughs> Again, that is a really rich question, and I'll start with the latter first, being a Black female coming up uh, in Xerox. So I had 38 years at Xerox, so I started in the early 80s, and we were clearly dealing with very similar things that we're dealing with today with diversity and inclusion, but we called it affirmative action and balanced workforce, trying to make sure that we had representation in the company. And the way Xerox was out front of everything is we formed caucus groups or affinity groups that were African-American uh, executives that went to David Kearns at the time and really pushed to have representation across the company. These groups also had regional chapters where we had pockets of African-American you know, employees in sales service and administration that would come together on a regular basis to be able to share and exchange strategies and training in order for us to make sure we were at the top of our game. Because one of the things as an African-American woman or male, there are rules that they won't tell you about. And unless you have somebody who has been around those tables or in those environments, that can share back with you and tell you that story, you could be going in blind and have no idea 
why things aren't going the way you want them to go. These particular, you know, groups really enabled us to be excellent at what we did. And as a black female, you know, whenever there was a decision to make um, a hire for a minority, black females were always second thought because they would look at the black male first. If they were looking at a woman to make a decision on, again, the black woman would be second down because they would always consider the white female. So then we at Xerox created a black women's leadership caucus group. So we could not only support the black agenda, but we would also support the black women's agenda. And by doing that, we would give people like myself opportunities to do training for our people. And so we would do training on things like time management, how to manage your manager, uh, what does it mean to deliver a performance appraisal, how do you manage a difficult conversation, etc. And those things, while we were understanding that piece of the business, which were HR related, but very important to making sure that you were excellent in what you did, it gave you the opportunity to master your skills. And they pushed us. Those black executives that we would report to, they would make sure that you overachieved. Because then they knew when you were out there by yourself, you would be excellent at anything that you do. Because we do have the skills. We do have the credibility. If given the opportunity, <laughs> we can definitely perform. But without having those people in those meetings talking about us, putting their careers on the line to suggest take the opportunity for these people to move, we would never have been there. And then your last question was about how uh, some beautiful some tips yes. that I can give people. Yeah. I'll give you three things. One, be yourself, but make sure you understand who you are. And when doing that, make sure that your values rest with you and that you can portray those excellent qualities that you have, whether it be authenticity, honesty, relationships, spiritualness, whatever they may be, know them cold. Second thing I would offer is make sure that you give yourself the space to explore and take on opportunities. Don't ever turn down opportunities because all they are are practices for you to become excellent at what you do. And even though it may not be exactly the way you think it should be, remember, you don't control this thing. We all have a higher coach who's in the universe, who's driving our true purpose. And as long as we show up and we are leaders and we project excellence, you will succeed. And the last thing, Gilles, I will share are six ethics of life, which I have on a sheet of paper that I've had for probably 30 years now that I always read every night. And I'll just quickly go through those six things. Before you pray, believe. Before you speak, listen. Before you spend, earn. Before you write, think. Before you quit, try. And before you die, live. Wow, this is so powerful. Thank you so very, very much. Uh, I mean, this last quote is, is fantastic. I'm going to ask you to just go back to the quote that Eric, your husband, gives you because they've asked for it again. If you can just say it again, and then I, I will Surely. conclude with two questions that the public has. Sure, it's by St. Jerome. Uh, so and we're the getting quote frozen. Is, uh, can you hear me? Did you hear me? I can hear you. I can hear you. Okay. I can hear you. you can you hear me? Okay, so we'll take just a, a second or two. Take a second or two uh, until the internet is stable. Yes, please, please go, go uh, with the quote. Can you hear me now? Yes, it's all good. Okay, it's by St. Jerome, and the quote is, good, better, best. Never let it rest until your good is better and your better is best. 
Did you hear it? Gilles, did you get it? Okay, let me repeat it if I remember it correctly. Good, better, best. Never let it rest. Never let it rest until your good is better. And your, your better, better is best. Is best. I missed something probably in it, but I will. No, I'll take no, it no, from no. you and I'll share it with people. Yes, and I'll take it from you and I will share it on the internet with people. Uh, two. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say that you said it correct. Okay. Okay. Great. Great. Thank you. Uh, so two questions from the, uh, from the audience. Um, one is on the digital side. So how do you connect with a digital audience? And I think you do lots of it yourself on the internet, putting yourself out there, but I'll let you I'll give some insights. And the other one is from a young uh, gentleman that I don't know, Lamin Tech 07. Uh, how to lead older team members as a young entrepreneur? And we'll finish on that. Okay, so the first question is, how do I use digital platforms in order to get my message across? That's right. um, obviously, social media is the way to do it. In regards to opportunities where I have done panel interviews or I have done speaking arrangements, sometimes I will take snippets from those and then share them either on LinkedIn or Facebook um, accordingly. There are Zoom discussions that I have done where I have done workshops and trainings for individuals, but clearly we are still um, finding new ways to make our digital platforms more meaningful for multiple people to be able to extend upon. You mentioned my commencement speech that I will be given for Mercy College next week. Yeah. We actually did that. It will be a virtual commencement ceremony, and my commencement speech was videotaped, but they will play it, and therefore I will have that in my archives to use. So that's how I use digital uh, platforms. If that, hopefully that helps. And for an entrepreneur, those are ways in which you can build up on your Facebook, start your followings, be able to have good content that people will want to come and listen to as a blogger or as just sharing a brief 50 second, you know, spot check on a topic. Uh, utilize your knowledge to share articles and make sure that you stay in contact with those individuals and stay on point with the messages that you're trying to deliver. Hopefully that answered your question. Thank you. Um, yeah, and the second question again, Jill. It was a young entrepreneur uh, leading, uh, you know, what tools to lead older right. people. Yeah. <laughs> so again, you know, and I've had those situations when I was an up and coming sales manager, where I had people that were salespeople that had been on uh, in the company for, you know, 25, 30 years. And one of the things you have to do is um, when you have a team, the first thing you should do, in my opinion, is meet with each one of them individually. Don't necessarily make it your agenda, but make it their agenda so that you can get to understand what makes them tick and what things they like. And when you get with someone who is older than you are, A, you always want to give them the respect because they have experiences that you have never experienced yet. But then also you have to make it clear who the manager is. And therefore you strike an opportunity to build that contract, so to speak, with an individual on how you are there to make them successful and how they will be successful as long as we work together. Now they may come back to you and say, I, there's nothing for me to learn from you. And you can say, well, you know what? Let's wait and see, because I'm sure there are things that I'll learn from you. There will be things that you will learn from me, but then together, there will be things that both of us will learn, but it will be together. And if we're serious about being successful, then let's get down to what are our objectives and goals and what is it going to take for you to deliver against your business objectives and where can I help you succeed and together we win. Wow, that Valerie, was, that, was, that was a lesson and a half. 
uh, in, in the, this 30 minutes. And there are lots of messages saying that they want to carry on. But I, I thank you for your time. I thank you for being who you are. I am so grateful to have you in my life as my mentor. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is an extraordinary person. And we're so lucky to have had you today. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to everybody who joined. I so appreciate you. And it's perfect, Jill, that we did this today on a Thursday, because today is Thankful Thursday. Oh, wow. Yes, it is. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Before we go, just a few information. Next week, we'll have somebody who's been also a part of this main group that uh, you were speaking about, Kevin, uh, Kevin Stevens, uh, who will be sitting in your spot. And Kevin Stevens has uh, had an incredible career at Xerox, but then he went on to work for five different companies, uh, had to merge and acquire different companies over 10 companies. And he was a senior executive. He was number two in uh, that company that was put onto the marketplace into the Dow Jones and into the stock. So lots of rich experiences also of public speaking and selling uh, that are coming on. But to you, Valerie, just thank you from the bottom of my heart, uh, personally, and on behalf of Acosphere and everybody who came, thank you so much for coming, uh, for coming here today. Uh, we're doing this every week. And please make sure that you put that in your calendar and you never miss an opportunity to see great leaders like Valerie share their experiences and their know-how. Thank you once again, Valerie. Thank you so much. Good luck, everyone. Stay safe and be well. Take care.